Session was, uh, let's go to that exact, well, I have it up here. Managing the explosion, uh, the explosive growth and consolidation of data in the cloud. Um, it, it, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, uh, maybe in a different fashion. First off, I'll get started with my introductions. My name is Greg Deschmaker. I'm with Intel. I manage our state, local, and education business here in California. Um, we had a guest speaker, Brad Schaefer. So if you looked on the uh, syllabus and you were expecting to come see a guy by the name of Brad Schaefer, who's a heck of a lot smarter than I am, unfortunately, Brad wasn't able to uh, make it down from Portland today. Uh, he had a last minute uh, uh, issue that arose and, and called him uh, to another duty. So I'm pinch hitting, and as such, uh, I'm going to do my best uh, possible to uh, give you a, a flavor of the content that Brad would have been going through. Um, by way of background, I'm 14 years at Intel. I've spent about 20 years in the uh, data center business. Um, during my time at Intel, uh, leading up to this last six years where I was managing the, our, our public sector business out here in the West, I managed uh, for about three, three and a half years our uh, U.S. team for Intel Solution Services, which was a boutique consulting arm of Intel focused primarily in the data center, so primarily sharing best practices around data, dinner, data center design, architecture, management. Um, and then uh, prior to that, I was with Intel uh, Online Services back in the early 2000s. I don't know if any of you remember uh, a stint of about uh, four years or so where Intel was actually in the outsourced data center business. This was really the first iteration of cloud when you think about you know taking data center infrastructure outsourcing that um, and in that capacity I uh, uh, had the real pleasure and probably one of the greatest growth opportunities in my career when you think about the companies I was working with and the things I was doing as we engaged uh, th this was uh, in the early years with Google uh, for example when they had six pods uh, scattered around the world. I ended up working with them. We had two of those pods in our data center. Um, and and uh, really, you know, when you think about how do we do shared services and how do we fundamentally plan and design to, to uh, architect for the unknown, um, I've got a little bit of experience in it, at least from that regards. Granted, I'm a sales guy. So, uh, you know, you don't, don't uh, hold me accountable for getting too technical on you today. Um, if successful, uh, we'll go through this conversation and you'll leave with more questions than answers. And what I mean by that is at least if we go through this conversation, and I want it to be just that, but let's have a conversation about what are the right questions to be asking as you go on this journey to the cloud. and and. Journey to the cloud, I think, is a little, it's kind of a funny thing to say, right? Because a lot of what we think of when we think of cloud compute, we have been, as I just discussed, we've been doing for years. Um, you know, the root tenants of virtualization, uh, shared services, um, so on and so forth, right? I mean, it's really, and I'm going to uh, show a slide in here that is a maturity model. And I think it's a great illustration when we think of where we've been, where we're at, where we're going. And it's a tool, one of many, but this maturity model that I'll show you I think is a great tool that's come out of the Open Data Center Alliance that you can use to plot yourself against. And there's no good or bad or right or wrong when plotting yourself against this maturity model, but it's a good baseline to establish when understanding where you really are in terms of the maturation process of getting to, you know, when we think about uh, cloud in an Intel definition, we think of cloud as being uh, federated, automated, and client aware. Those are three of the primary tenants when we think of a true cloud environment. And I'll get into a little bit more of, of what that entails. Uh, but when you think about what are the decisions we be, need to be making today that enable us to get there, that's where we're going to focus. Does anybody uh, sit in the keynote? speech early this morning? Okay. I would say that this discussion 
is maybe 180 degrees from that. Whereas Brian got up this morning and talked about the future and what might be possible in the year 2020 and beyond and what the impact of all of this uh, when we think about having uh, all of this, you know, internet of things and the impact it's going to have on human lives uh, in the citizens of California, this discussion is about the right now. Uh, on any given day, folks are making purchasing decisions, implementation decisions, um, so on and so forth, whether it be on server, storage, network, client, each one of those decision points is an opportunity to either create a closed environment that's going to put you on an island uh, and unable to attain this dream of getting to a more open cloud aware uh, sort of model, or it's going to be an enabling step that you take. Um, I'm going to draw, if, if I can, I'm going to get out here and draw a little bit of a visual. By the way, who sat in the last session with CGI? I thought it was just funny that the last session was, it's not about the servers, it's about the services, and then you have the Intel guy getting up, because obviously for us we think it's about the servers. But uh, uh, it, it, Josh and the team, I mean, I, I say that jokingly because it's about all of it, right? I mean, you gotta, it's an Indian thing here. All right, so we, you know, if we think of, and I apologize about having my back to you, it's very poor speaking technique. Um, but if, if cloud is really this thing, you know, that's the that, that ubiquitous state of mind that we're all trying to get to, um, we normally, you know, think of this, especially our business leaders, right? It's like, all right, we're gonna just naturally progress up to this utopian state of, of having this great, you know, federated model that's fully automated uh, and so forth. But we all know, especially anybody in here who's actual, you know, practitioners from an IT standpoint or in the world of procurement, that it really looks more like this. And each one of these steps is some uh, inflection point that you're coming across, right? I mean, you guys work on a fiscal year that goes from July 1 to June 30th. You've got uh, within those periods, planning discussions, discussions that are going on that are leading up to actual investments or decision points of which something's going to happen, either something that's going to be bought in the way of product or service, or something's going to be implemented in the way of new processes within your environment. And it doesn't flow like this, right? It's typically when that happens, we have this spike up. And these, it, it's a, each one of these inflection points, right? where we're having to make uh, some pretty critical decisions, and what we're trying to do is mitigate risk. So, if you walk away here with nothing today, um, this would be one of those things that, as simple as it is in concept, I think it's important that we use this sort of thinking in our communication, both within the IT organization, but also as we communicate with our business leaders, so that they understand that this is the world of reality, right? And that even though there's things, you know, cloud is reality in a lot of areas today, but we're not going to take California's, you know, $2.5 million IT budget and everything that is encompassed within that and shove it into this tomorrow, are we? There's going to be a journey that gets us there. The material that's here, and you'll kind of notice as we go through it, came from three primary areas. Um, one is Intel marketing, so I apologize, there's a little bit of marketing material in there, but I'm trying to, you'll notice it's, it's fairly tame. Uh, another key area that the data was pulled from was the Open Data Center Alliance. Anybody familiar with ODCA? Okay, if you're not, that's going to be another key takeaway that I uh, uh, try to provide you today. If not ODCA, making sure that you're aware of the type of resources beyond that that are out there. Um, and then the third area that data was pulled from for this was our own Intel IT organization. We're an organization of 105,000 employees scattered around the globe. Um, and like you, we have similar challenges in terms of how we're going to leverage these next generation technologies 
to run the business of Intel more effectively and efficiently. So this is, you know, the marketing stuff, right? It's the stuff you guys already know. How many today, times today have you probably already seen a slide like this? It's an internet of things. We got 15 billion devices going to be connected here in about a couple of years, blah, 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 blah. We know that it's driving this massive growth of data, though, that's very difficult to get ahead of. Who speaks in zettabytes? I mean, that's, uh, I had to actually go look it up. <laughs> you know, when we think about, you know, gigabytes moving to terabytes, moving to, you know, this is a, that's a lot of data when you get into, uh, and especially if you look at the short timeline of which we're getting there. 2011, right? This is already dated in terms of where we were at, you know, 1.5. Uh, with, within two years, we're going to be at this 4.8 zettabytes of IP traffic on the network. Is that just in the United States? That's globally. globally. Yeah. Um, I talked to you before about, you know, again, through the lens of Intel, how we define the cloud. Um, and first off, how many of you even think of Intel when you think of the cloud? Again, I don't want, this isn't a, a marketing pitch as go buy Intel, uh, but do you know that when we think about our, especially our public cloud environment, right? I mean, all the Googles and Amazons and Facebook, you know, all those types, but any of the other, you know, software as a service providers, uh, you name it, we're about 94% of that market segment share in terms of what's powering those uh, cloud environments today. We care, uh, obviously, and, but it's it, by being uh, in that position, we've had a tremendous opportunity to have visibility into how this has been transforming and the discussions we're having with those organizations as to what they see coming next, what needs to be architected and designed next. And as Brian spoke about this morning, from an Intel standpoint, we take it pretty seriously because as we stand up the fabs that are manufacturing these processors that are going to power uh, this environment in the future, that's a five to ten year lead time from the point where we draw the line in the sand saying here's what that architecture is going to be till the time that the fab is built and we have processors coming out the other side of it. So when you think about, you know, the challenge of, you know, I appreciate where you guys are sitting in your position trying to get your head around what are the things we need to be doing right now and getting ahead of this. Um, we especially can appreciate that challenge when we think about having to be five to ten years out uh, in terms of the specific, you know, architectures that's going in there. Um, and, the, and these are the tenants today that we're, that we focus on. Um, you know, Ron has spoke a couple times today, and I think any of you who know him understand that his vision here in the state, and I know that, by the way, mixing the audience of state versus local government versus education. How about state folks raise your hand? <coughs> Predominantly. Any local government? Okay. And what about education? Okay. By the way, where are you at from? UC Okay. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, but Ron talks very much about a hybrid model, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, he, he, California's looking at standing up, and, and this is not unique at all, right? He's, he's uh, talking about having a, a, on California's raised floor, a private cloud sort of model that provides for shared services, and that it then is enabled to, you know, public cloud will be utilized in an as-needed basis and where it's, it's going to be opportunistic, I think, early on and becoming more and more strategically adopted as we move forward. But regardless, these three things have to be a truism regardless of if it's uh, within the private cloud or in the public cloud environment. And it's very difficult, especially when we think about uh, security, but not just security. When we think about performance and all of a sudden we are in a federated model where, you know, we've got an application now that might be spanning both a private cloud environment of which we have total control over what that infrastructure is to now some of that is sitting out in a public cloud environment of which we don't today 
have any visibility or assurance of what that is running on. And one of the things that the industry as a whole is working extremely hard on is to provide visibility for the user into that. And it's not getting down to the bits and bytes, right? Because one of the promises of cloud is, hey, it's behind the cloud or behind the black screen. I shouldn't care. But what you should be able to care about is what the SLA is going to be uh, and that. And what we're trying to do through alliances like the Open Data Center Alliance is put mechanisms in place, set standards, such that you as the consuming audience or the IT practitioners within this, and, and we're looking at 2015 as a very realistic date to have some tangible tools and capabilities to have that sort of access and visibility for better management uh, of assuring these three, uh, these three vectors. This goes without saying. Um, from a storage standpoint, right, I mean, that was kind of the title of, uh, and it was kind of funny that, you know, this uh, session was teed up. I, hopefully you, you all didn't uh, come thinking you were going to get a deep dive technical conversation around next generation storage. Um, but I know that the title was, was somewhat leading along those lines. But I can't, it, it can't be overstated the importance of that. And when we think about storage, right, intelligent tiering, compression, thin provisioning, through the lens of Intel, how we see this changing and at least why we care, but we hope that you as a consuming audience uh, are getting yourselves really smart about this. Storage of old, right? I mean, it was, you know, when we think of unintelligent versus intelligent storage, um, the intelligent storage, the reason why we care now is now that's actually got server processing capabilities within that storage of which we are providing intelligent analytics capabilities to the, the uh, folks who are managing that storage environment so that we can, in fact, better utilize, instead of just continually mushrooming, mushrooming, mushrooming the, the storage uh, capacity, we're actually using that intelligence to um, do these capabilities around tiering, compression, and thin provisioning so that we can have things such as, I mean, I, I think the data around this is, if you look at the ROI on, on uh, uh, real-time compression. I think it's uh, potential savings of like 50 to 80 percent if by doing real-time compression uh, in terms of what your your uh, uh, capex expenditure can be on storage. I and mean, that makes a huge difference in terms of how you approach your storage strategy. And if you're not already deeply engaged in these discussions, which I'm sure all of you are with all of the likely folks, EMC, HP, IBM, et cetera, right, in the, in the storage environment. Um, this is, I think, a, a critical, critical piece of understanding what it's going to take to be able to get us ahead of the curve there. Go ahead. Uh, in this scenario, where, where does the encryption go? Because um, in the state, we, we get to protect most of our data. Right, right. Um, it's a good question. I mean, it's obviously got to be part of the discussion, and it's not captured in this particular visual, but I think it goes without saying that when you think of the, the encryption as well as, uh, well, just knowing where the data is, right? The auditing capabilities, that's, that's a key element that we're trying to get to um, within, within the space. Right. They're easily uh, stealable, so or misplaceable. Yep. So uh, you, you got to you got to have some sort of encryption uh, to protect that data. Well, you know, and it's interesting. I, I talk about you know this model over here of these inflection points where buying decisions are being made, and I referenced uh, server storage network, but I also referenced client there at least. And if I didn't, I should have right. Um, it's a component that is absolutely part of the enterprise infrastructure 
know, if we think of these foundation layers, of the you know foundation layer building blocks, um, I think it's probably one of the most overlooked components when people are making the decisions that they are today about how they're going to, in fact, uh, achieve this. There are, there's going to be the requirements around data management, encryption, and security. And yeah, we're going to be putting measures at the data center layer in terms of how to audit and manage that. But there's absolute uh, incredible technology that's now flowing into the clients. But it's only as good as what people are aware of. I think that's maybe part of my messaging here is trying to draw some awareness to where you should be going and asking the questions. Go and ask uh, any of your enterprise client vendor uh, companies today what they're doing around that, whether it be HP, Dell, Lenovo, um, et cetera. As we have, we've got 140, I think it's 140 new designs on, in terms of form factors and use cases that have hit the market in the last five to six months when we think of tablet and these what we're calling ultrabooks, right? You've seen these convertible devices, the, you know, it's a laptop when you need it, uh, a tablet when you want it. And out of those 140 new designs, you can imagine there's a whole spectrum of options available, but there's a subset in there that are truly enterprise grade devices that are uh, able or you know have components that will enable that sort of functionality around encryption um, and data management. You think about uh, IPT, uh, which is identity protection technology, right? That's going to, when, uh, as that user out at the edge, and our, uh, our chief information security officer, Malcolm Harkins, he uses a statement, the people are the perimeter. Well, if the people are the perimeter and their primary device is this user interface, which is a tablet, a laptop, a PC, an Ultrabook, we better sure the heck understand what we're putting in the hands of our users and we better know what we're doing to secure and manage those devices. Because if we think, you know, this, this whole phenomena of BYO that is great, it's giving users choice, it's saying, well, the demand, let's face it, the demand is coming from the users with their smartphones and their tablets. Um, but it's really creating a tremendous challenge from the IT practitioner standpoint in terms of, all right, if we're going to allow access from these devices into the network, what are we doing? You know, we can, we've got our MDM solutions, all of that, but I think that we've got to quickly get to that next step of what is it that we then know about the device? You know, I mentioned the three tenets, federated, automated, client aware. The client aware component of this discussion is what are you building into your core infrastructure at the data center that will ensure that you can see what's coming out from the outside, but also what is it that those devices at the edge are providing in the way of identification as it pertains to what their capabilities are. And there's a big spectrum of really good and enterprise grade and ready from a client standpoint and very much consumer-only device. And if you're trying to run an enterprise, here in California we have 200,000 clients today. And that's just PCs and laptops. That does not uh, account for any of the client devices that are currently being brought on the network in the way of smartphones or tablets that are BYO model. And I think it's safe to say that that's going to get bigger before it gets smaller. Um, We've got to have some processes in place that assure we know how to understand what the devices are and uh, how to manage around that. Great question. This is a slide, quite honestly, I'm not even very qualified to speak to. All I can say is you, we go through this list of you know, what, what's required from a storage standpoint, client standpoint, uh, server standpoint, this model of moving from a traditional network to a software-defined network, you know, this is an area that I think is fairly getting into some relatively new area. I mean, you know, software-defined network uh, in its basic form been around quite a while. But uh, from an Intel standpoint, we are working both independently and putting out some reference design stuff in this area. 
but we're also working hand in hand with all of the major players in the networking space to see what is it that we can do to provide greater intelligence when we think about um, this next generation of network that's going to have to handle this massive spike in, in data traffic. Um, you know, I'll kind of leave it at that just because, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm just not the subject matter expert on this uh, particular one, and I apologize. Open Data Center Alliance. So I mentioned this. I'm really going to drive into this a little bit. Um, this is a consortium of organizations, both public sector and private sector. I will say that today it's predominantly private sector. And there's a little bit of a shout out to you all to say they're looking for membership. The membership is, in essence, an area to give yourself a voice. Because this is one of the major organizations out there, and it's not the only one, but this organization, and you can look at it just by the names that are involved there, from a steering committee standpoint, the contributing members, uh, adopter members, which are well into the hundreds, but the standards by which the open cloud environment is being defined by is coming out of alliances such as this. And if we go back into the 90s, right, any of you guys who were network geeks uh, and, you know, dealing with CCITT um, standards and things like that, right, that's how those bodies were born. And as we think of cloud having this mushroom effect, we're probably not going to have as anything as cut and dried as a CCITT in terms of defining what the standards are for openness and interoperability. Um, we're trying right, to get there, and the greater participation in this, the better. But uh, so besides having a voice in terms of really being able to say or you know, drive where these standards are going, it's also a great area for data now coming out of it. So the Open Data Center Alliance, I think, has been in place now for about a full two years uh, or a year and a half. It's about a year and a half, two years. Um, I think this is a great visual, right? Uh, this is the, the maturity model that I spoke to earlier. And in a little bit, I told you I've got some data that comes out of our own IT organization. So this is ODCA's model. And in a couple of slides, I'm going to show you how Intel maps ourselves against this model. Not, and, and again, don't take the Intel thing as, hey, it's the right, <laughs> where we're at is the right place to be. It's only showing it by example saying, Hey, we went through the exercise of doing it, and here's how we're viewing ourselves as it relates to this. It's probably a good exercise to go through yourselves. But I like the way that they've broken it out, first and foremost, by focusing on the end user. Before, and then, obviously, you know, if you think of you, you know, either users or consumers down the left-hand column there as who were, and, and, and this being time, going from left to right. Um, but the end user... I'll go back to Brian's speech this morning. Why do any of this if we're not going to, at the end of the day, provide a positive impact or outcome for the consumers or end users that we're serving? So getting into you know, what this means for, our, for Intel. And again, uh, I've been working with the public sector for six years, and, and I know that the best example to show you is normally a peer of yours out of public sector. Uh, the challenge that we, the reason why I'm using the Intel data here from our own IT organization is because we're Intel, our IT organization, for better or for worse, has to adopt these things typically a good five years ahead of when you all uh, sometimes even have the opportunity to start adopting these things. As such, uh, and again, it can be both a blessing and a curse if you're Intel, um, but we're able to generate some key learnings and best practices out of what we're seeing and doing as a result of that. And I think it's important to do that and turn around and share that. Again, only in the spirit of best practice. But it gives you an idea of how our own IT organization is defining what this means to Intel. Um, and I've already talked a little bit about, you know, the attributes, service models uh, that we look at. But 
and I don't think any of these are new, different, or unique from what uh, we've heard probably 10 times today already, right? Rapid elasticity, uh, resource pooling. Honestly, is there anything on this slide that you see that hasn't already either been communicated to you or that you're already thinking of and defining for your own needs? This end, though, takes down and says, all right, you know, we, we, we plot ourselves against that maturity model. We look at ourselves today um, and where we're going to tomorrow. And in our world, uh, starting with, you know, we, we now 73% virtualized across uh, the environment. Um, again, you look at our environment, I mentioned employee size, right? We, we support about half the number of employees that, that the state does. That's across about 69 data centers, which probably seems like a lot to most of you. You know, we went through the whole era of data center consolidation here in the last few years, and we were on a, on a trajectory to try to get down to a handful, right? And we did that in terms of our major data center footprints, but in our situation, we also quickly realized that because of latency reasons, because of uh, the fact that as a multinational publicly traded corporation, we have uh, strict guidelines as far as where data sits and what borders it can move over or not. Um, and many other variables. And with that, we ultimately, you know, so we're kind of in this, you know, major data center locations with satellites that spin off of that today. In that environment, about 73% virtualized. Um, and in this bullet, 80% of new services are going into the cloud. I think that's an interesting data point, right? So when we think about, all right, are we going to forklift upgrade everything that all application environment and just shove it into a cloud sort of model? Not necessarily. It's more anything coming on as new, 80% of which is cloud. I don't think, again, that's a rocket science sort of discussion point, but I think it's good to internalize it when you think about your own environment and especially when we communicate to our business stakeholders as to where we think the greatest value of cloud is going to be. I'm already seeing that here in the in uh, uh, the state. We have, you know, I look at RFPs that are coming out, whether it be in the GIS space or in uh, healthcare services, and more often than not, it's these new apps that are going to have to be, if we're going to have to stand up a new app anyway, those are ripe for opportunity of landing in a cloud sort of model, whether it be truly public cloud or some sort of hybrid model. As we move into the future, right, these are some of the goals that we have in this hybrid cloud uh, environment. And again, it's all about improving the experience for the end user uh, in terms of performance, uh, time, to, time to money, uh, et cetera. So this is Intel's mapping of our own world against that Open Data Center Alliance maturity model. And our guys took it one step further and uh, both in the way of, of thinking along the lines of, you know, each one of those pillars where you look at, uh, we say, hey, minimal industry solutions, uh, early industry solutions. We kind of use some vocabulary to describe each one of these intersects and then also put a calendar line at least in, in terms of our progression to it. Again, this is not a right or wrong sort of answer, but I think it's a good exercise for pretty much any organization to go through today when plotting yourself against this um, and then going from this back over to this sort of line of thinking in terms of where are your major intersects of investment in hardware, software, services, implementation of new processes, and I'll go back to the hardware uh, and that those infrastructure building blocks don't limit it just to the data center. This is, is a discussion around the server, storage, network environment, security components. The client compute devices are going to be critical as it pertains to all of this. Um, Gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, 
uh, where we see ourselves progressing from here, you know, if, if we think of just recently in, in 2009 to this last year, uh, and as we move forward, right, I mean, it's kind of a restatement of what we saw two slides ago. Um, I think the interesting one, right, zero impact on business, because one of the things that when, when we go into this cloud environment, our guys are looking at is, hey, there may be greater potential for uh, in other words, we're going to design for failure in the case that if we've got applications residing on stuff that isn't managed and owned by Intel ourselves, and yes, we're going to have an SLA with whatever the provider is, we're not going to solely bank on that SLA uh, and risk Intel uh, uptime and availability on that. We're, we're going to go ahead and actually design for failure such that if we've got one aspect of our application environment sitting out there that goes down, we better have it being, yeah, our mean time to recovery better be incredibly quick. And it's fundamentally changing how our application guys are looking at their world of, of app development um, and management. I think these next few slides are areas that I'm gonna really blow through quickly, unless you guys want me to stop on any of them. Um, because I'm limited on time and quite honestly, these are things that if you wanted to ever have an opportunity to have a more in-depth discussion about any one of these things with Intel as to how we do it, how we look at it, I'd be more than happy to uh, line up a more intimate discussion along those lines with the guys who know a, a heck of a lot more than I do about it. But as you can see, as I do go through these, right, we like to use a lot of modeling in the way that we communicate. I mean, this is all our internal stuff, right? This is how Intel IT communicates back to our business stakeholders in terms of where they're at, where they're going, and why they're going there. Um, so just in summary, right, I've got two sli summary slides here. One, uh, as a company that is built our entire existence on the idea of standards-based open architecture is absolutely a winner. Anything that is, uh, using a tagline from Brian's conversation this morning, uh, closed systems by definition typically have an expiration date on them, and especially as we talk about this world of cloud, which the very definition of it insists that anything fitting into it is going to have to be open by design. Um, but it also absolutely, you know, we feel accelerates uh, innovation. Um, my contact information is there. Uh, this is an easy one, right? Greg at intel.com. While I may not be the foremost subject matter expert on this, I'm a pretty damn good conduit to some of the most brilliant minds, I think, in the world, not only within our own walls, but when you think about Intel being kind of the epicenter of, of a lot of this, uh, Maybe Epicenter is overstating it. How about, uh, you know, the Switzerland of, uh, of technology, right? We're pretty friendly and inside of most of any of the major uh, vendor solutions that you all would be looking to work with or acquire and, and bring into your environment. We're a pretty friendly face to be able to go through, to be able to have those conversations in a vendor neutral manner. And we're pretty good about pulling in those resources if we don't have them within our own walls. Uh, so I recommend it, please take advantage of that. Um, but I'm gonna go back to uh, these two other areas. Uh, Open Data Center Alliance, as you see the, uh, the URL there, opendatacenteralliance.org. If you forget it, uh, use my email. If you need a card, come grab one. And then, uh, what did I bring here? This is, you know, I showed that, uh, the, the uh, maturity model, but this is another sample of output coming out of the Open Data Center Alliance. This is uh, their uh, master usage model. It's compute infrastructure as a service, Rev.1, emphasis on Rev.1. This is a living, breathing alliance of which getting on board with them and as a, either as a, an adopter mender, member or other, uh, I mean, all this stuff is publicly available to you 
And there's really some phenomenal information that's coming out of this. Um, and then out of uh, Intel IT best practices in the same spirit. That's a great resource for you to be able to go to, download white papers, case studies, you name it. And our guys are the full open kimono. Anything we do within our IT organization when it comes to this type of thing, we try to share best practices, worst practices, right? Um, so that uh, you can take this journey and have uh, some real world, exp you know, uh, we've already been there type of information at your fingertips. So with that, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to sit through uh, this discussion today. Hopefully I was able to impart a little bit of, uh, you know, a couple of nuggets that you can take with you. And again, more importantly, hopefully you walk away with a few questions that you might go back and ask within your own organizations that you wouldn't have otherwise uh, thought of asking before. So on that note, do you have any questions for me? Very good. Well, on that note, I'll uh, let you get on to your next session. Thank you so much.